Hello, folks, and welcome back to English 437-537 with me, Dr. Matt Barton. Got a great topic here for you today. We'll be talking about social media ROI. Usually means return on investment. Companies spend some money on a consultation program. They're paying you to do some social media stuff for them. How do you show that what you're doing is working? So Martin proposes we rethink this term and actually start thinking about it as return on influence instead of return on investment. So I think that's pretty clever. We'll get into that. And then we'll talk some about journalism, journalism in the digital age. What's it like to be a reporter? And even though you might be thinking, well, this is not a journalism class. Uh, this is an English class. You know, I certainly, you know, understand uh, some possible uh, question marks there, some quizzical looks. But uh, on the other hand, I think a lot of this is applicable to any kind of writing, especially any kind of research writing. You, you know, it's the same stuff, right? You, know, you have to know what your sources are, be able to verify those sources, uh, be able to write clearly, have some sense of structure, you know, be thinking about an audience. So all of that stuff is the same. Uh, but also I like this because I, I just personally think it's, <clears throat> well, it's not really personal. I just think it's useful for all of us to have some sense of how the news works you know, how are these folks collecting information? What are they, what should they be doing? <laughs> Let's put it that way. <laughs> uh, to verify their sources and make sure they're presenting uh, accurate information. And the role uh, that newspapers and news plays in uh, a government like ours, where it's supposed to be, at least uh, in some sense, democratic, uh, right? So I think there's a lot, of, a lot here to think about beyond just, uh, even if you have no intentions whatsoever of going into journalism. Uh, that said, I do have a quick uh, link here. You can see here to our BS program in mass communications here at St. Cloud State. Uh, so I don't know how much of the, these courses are available online, but I did think it was worth showing you this quickly, just a couple of these courses. There's an MCOM 340, which is Introduction to Multimedia Journalism. So you see there, you get hands-on experience with campus media outlets. They've got a multimedia news writing and producing and then a broadcast and online journalism reporting. <clears throat> so a lot of options there if you're interested in this topic. And uh, yes, some of those will have uh, prerequisites on them, but I bet, you know, you could probably talk to one of the professors there, maybe get uh, into those courses as a English major, perhaps. <laughs> just, to, just because you, you're curious about this and you want to learn more. Uh, anyway, let's look at our learning uh, objectives here. We'll be talking about the difference between return on influence and investment, exploring the roles of the digital journalist, understanding the basics of good reporting, uh, how journalism can tap into social networks, a lot of uh, controversial stuff there, and uh, being able to verify info, including stuff you find on social media, how in the world do you know this is legit news and not just some kind of hoax. And I'll also be looking at ethical approaches to social media and some policies for social media use, whether you're using the social media in an official capacity or whether you're just doing this on your own time. We find that even if you say, well, this is just my personal Facebook, or this is my personal Twitter feed, yet we're finding time and time again it does impact your profession. You know, if you're working for NPR and you're just posting stuff on Twitter under a personal account, it can still uh, cause problems for you and for NPR. And I would also say and that's certainly true for educators as well. You know, we I wrote an article, co-wrote an article about this very topic, uh, looking at teachers who are using social media within and without outside of the classroom and some of the ramifications of that. That's so a lot of this stuff, again, journalism, sure, but it also applies to uh, broader topics. Uh, so anyway, we're getting started here with Martin. She talks about the need for numbers. And so she says these executives, big surprise, uh, they don't want to spend a lot of money and then be told there's no real proof that the stuff they spent the money on had any impact, right? If you take out a big bunch of money for an ad campaign, you kind of want to see those cells going up, right? <laughs> Otherwise, you feel like you're just wasting money. Uh, the advertising isn't working. Uh, no advertising agency would be around for long if they couldn't uh, show you somehow that, yes, this is having some kind of impact. And so Martin's talked about this throughout the book. Uh, I guess here she's really trying to get into some brass tacks of you know, what, if we can't get the numbers, what can we say? 
Uh, so first she says, why do they, why do they even want the numbers? You know, basically we're looking here basically at the, the sales going up, uh, more customers and increased client base, uh, more viewers, you know, things of that sort. Uh, so she says numbers help justify decisions, remove risk, mitigate accountability, but they can also keep a great opportunity from being considered. And then she's got this great quote here. Uh, I forget who said it. I should, should attribute this to, I forget. Anyway, uh, the quote is, not everything that counts can be counted. Not everything that can be counted counts. So I know some of you are teachers like me, so you probably have come across this problem with the numbers uh, in terms of teaching. You know, somebody says, uh, we need an assessment to see, make sure that what you're, the way you're teaching the content is, is uh, sinking in, right? <laughs> How can you prove that your teaching methods are working? We want to see some data, you know, and of course the problem is how do you get reliable data that shows that? And there's problems with just any kind of approach. You know, they used to just say, well, look, the GPAs are going up, right? There used to be a 2.0 GPA and now it's, uh, you know, the students are graduating with like uh, high school anyway, with like 4.0 <laughs> uh, in, in universities, the GPAs are going up, right? So that must mean that uh, teachers are getting better at their jobs. But uh, of course you probably have already thought of the possible explanation for that. Maybe it's just grade inflation, right? And, you, know, you talk about, well, stand, how about standardized tests? You know, just give every school the same test and that will work, just have a national standard. Uh, but again, there's that, that approach is rife with problems. And so I think that the this quote kind of sums it all up. You know, I feel like some it is kind of subjective, but you know, I feel like anybody who's taught a class, at least a couple of classes, you, you sort of have a sense of what, uh, the, whether the students are learning or not. It's it's difficult to sometimes to put that into hard numbers. Uh, and the same, I think, is what, I think that's exactly what Martin's talking about here. Yes, you can establish a social media presence. You can be consulting with a company. You can get them. Uh, you can build a really active community, people tweeting, retweeting, a lot of activity on your Facebook page for the company, a lot of Instagramming, uh, whatever. But then when you get down to like, let's talk about how, let's get down to like the data, the bottom line here, and that's where you hit the bump. <laughs> so, uh, so Martin has really tried her best, I think, to uh, get us over that bump, uh, give us some language anyway we can approach and things that look kind of like formulas <laughs> that you could take uh, to one of these executives and say, look, you know, here it is. Here's what, here's why this is working. Here's my evidence uh, for why the social media is paying off. Uh, it'd be kind of interesting to see how much of this we could translate into those other contexts. But, or, okay, so anyway, uh, impressions, what is that? If you've ever taken out an ad on Facebook or Google has an AdWords program, and I've done a little bit of this, you know, again, I'm not an expert at it by any means, but I, I know what they're talking about. So basically if you, uh, the impression just means that, if, you know, let's say I get on Google AdWords and I paid them so much, uh, usually you're bidding on a keyword. Uh, so let's just say I wanted like Matt Chat uh, to be uh, showing up at the very top of all the Google searches and have that sponsored link or whatever they call it. Uh, so you could pay some money and try to outbid other people that might be bidding on those keywords. And if it shows up on somebody's search, and whether they click on it or not, you know, if it just shows up on the screen there, the ad or that search term shows up, the link, uh, that's called an impression. And a lot of people, this is their go-to thing because it's kind of hard data. You could find out, like, how many times has these other sites gone in and pulled your uh, ad uh, from the source and pasted it onto their page and they call that an impression, you can count it. Now, the problem is that you might have millions of impressions and only like thousands <laughs> of clicks. Uh, so you know this, I mean, think about all the ads you see that you never click on. You know, this is, that's the difference between just an impression would be just like it's there, you might not even look at it, uh, versus the CPC, or the uh, that's cost per click or the clicking. Uh, so you can get more money uh, some of these services, what they'll do, like Google, I think, does this. So you don't get charged for the impressions. Uh, you only get charged if there's a click. So every time somebody clicks on the ad, uh, then you get to pay a Google sum. Uh, so it's a little. That's just some of the language, some of the stuff going on behind the scenes. Uh, but really, a lot of this is not that dissimilar to just television commercials. 
right? If you're just seeing random ads on a page that have nothing to do with you, that's uh, kind of a wasted opportunity there. It's kind of wasted money. Uh, really what you'd want to see is targeted ads. So a lot of what social media marketing is about is trying to help with that. Like, you know, how can we find out who is interested in these products? Let's say you got a line of fishing equipment. <laughs> Let's say you got ice fishing equipment. Uh, how do you get those your ads to people that are actually interested in <clears throat> ice fishing? And, you know, one of the answers is, well, let's look at social media. Let's get on Twitter, Facebook. Uh, let's see who's posting pictures uh, related to ice fishing on their uh, Instagrams, uh, whatever. And that will let you focus better, right? So that, I think that's what a lot of this is about. Uh, so what are some alternatives to impressions? Just, again, just counting the number of times content is displayed. Uh, so if you get on some of these uh, marketing sites, start reading that stuff. Uh, again, not my area, uh, but they'll talk about reach versus impressions. So the impressions is just showing up. Uh, the reach is the people number of unique people who saw your content. So impressions, number of times your content is dis displayed versus number of unique people who saw your content. Uh, so you could imagine just see, you might see the same ad several times uh, versus several different people seeing the same ad, you know, is the, what they're talking about there. Uh, <clears throat> It doesn't really probably doesn't do too much good for you to keep seeing that same ad over and over. Uh, so some alternatives to this that Martin talks about and some of these other things I looked at uh, talk about uh, are the shares. So it's a lot more uh, valuable, I suppose, if you share something. So if I see, and this has happened to me sometimes, I'm on Facebook and there'll be some ads there. Uh, it's, there's always like really cool looking boots. <laughs> always like, well, that's some pretty cool boots. And uh, I like some of the shirts I've seen there. Uh, so I'll, uh, they have some, I just, uh, just a while ago, actually, before I did this, I, f I saw some shoes that had uh, Star Trek logos on them. And I thought that's kind of funny. Uh, so I shared that ad to my Facebook page. So I would imagine that shoe company would really want to know that. Say, well, look, this guy, who is this guy? Matt Barton. Look, he, he just shared this link to these shoes. Uh, there's something there, right? I'm not just a I'm not just a random person with no interest in Star Trek at all, uh, no interest in shoes at all. You know, I've interacted with the content somehow. I've sort of engaged with them. Uh, so that's really what they, you know, what Martin is saying. That's what you want as a company: is people doing that sort of thing, sharing it. Uh, the sentiment we'll talk about in a minute. Uh, engagement. You know, if you commented on the, you know, the, the Star Trek shoes, there were a bunch of comments under it. People were talking to the shoe uh, company. <laughs> I didn't really do that. I think I might have liked it. Um, but, you know, you see on Twitter, we'll see in a minute, a lot of people engage with these companies. They talk to them. Uh, the fan affinity is another one of these measurements. Like how, how much is your product uh, part of that fan's life? I suppose. So you like are just a real casual Star Trek fan, or you like part of the the fandom, uh, somebody who's really into it and willing to buy a lot of products, because what they find at just about any of these fandoms or whatever, it's usually like ten percent of the people buying like ninety percent of the stuff. <laughs> uh, so like with the Star Trek merchandise, you probably got people to go out. There's a few people that just have to have everything they can buy. You know, if it's got a Star Trek logo on it. They, they buy it. They just get tons and tons of it. Uh, whereas most people might buy like one thing, you know, even if they've been watching the show or, or nothing. So that's the kind of uh, breakdown you're dealing with in a lot of cases. <clears throat> the sentiment analysis. See, this is a, this is the thing right here where I'm always saying, you think English major, you don't just instantly jump to technology and science. But you know, here's a good example of where a lot of the stuff that goes on in an English department. Uh, especially the linguistics department. I know uh, Edian uh, Kofi does a lot of work with uh, computational linguistics and natural language processing. By he, so he's basically doing this stuff, <laughs> and it's uh, they just they can't get enough people doing this work. It's like please do uh, you know study this, come work for us, make big money. <laughs> uh, but it just doesn't leap to a lot of people's minds. You know, if I said why don't you study sentiment analysis, he'd be like. <sighs> <laughs> go away <laughs> and never come back. I'm unfriending you. Uh, but, you know, give it a, look at what it is. It's actually pretty cool. 
Uh, so natural language processing, what that's about is, say you got all these tweets about our shoot, the shoes or whatever, and you want to find some way to get that into numbers. Uh, so what you try to do is create some algorithms, some procedures for the software to go in and like look at all of these posts, all of these responses, and see if you can pick up on uh, the language to tell whether this is somebody that likes it, is it somebody that's complaining about it, you know, what can you infer? Is it like the people like uh, this post or not like it? Not just talking about the actual like <laughs> like button. <laughs> That'd be easy. Uh, but just like why do they, if they type something about it, if they wrote something about it, can you tell, get the computer to tell you whether that was a positive or a negative? That's the uh, affective state just basically means the emotions. You know, is this somebody who's happy, sad, disappointed, whatever? Uh, so there's a lot of uh, science behind this. I've got the, I'm not going to click on it there, but you can read about this on Wikipedia. Uh, but you can see it's it's really a burgeoning field. I think there's a lot of uh, future in something like that. So if you're one of these people and you're like, I don't know what I want to do with my life. <laughs> I just want to make a good, I just want to have a good career making some money. Uh, I think that would be something you'd really want to look into if you have, a, maybe you really like language, but you're not sure how to translate that into a job. Uh, well, sentiment analysis might be for you. Okay, anyway, back to Martin uh, and her return for return on influence. And I noticed she had an article published in the Harvard Business Review. Sounds sounds good. Uh, so she says once you recognize that each entry into the social conversation is creating influence, then you can track it. So there's some interest in this topic. Uh, it's sort of a, there's a similar concept in uh, a visual rhetoric. I'm trying to think of the name of uh, of the uh, what do they call it tracking ideo ideographic tracking I think something along those lines. Uh, but what they basically what it means is you you try to follow you try to trace things back you try to keep a uh, almost like you're building a diagram or a, a sort of complicated flow chart of like you know, let's say I tweet something. And then we want to find out who's reading the tweet, who's retweeting it, uh, how is it showing up in different contexts? So did somebody post it on Facebook? Uh, who's replying to it and who's replying to those replies? Uh, so you're really trying to get beyond just a simple number and trying to figure out what are people doing with this? How are they interacting uh, with that content? And of course, if you're selling something, you'd want to know how, how many of this, you know, how is this translating into purchasing? People buying the product. You know, it's one thing for me to share that link about the Star Trek shoes. That's all well and good. That's a transaction. Uh, but I didn't buy them. <laughs> so maybe, though, uh, somebody else that saw my... I, I shared it. Maybe somebody somewhere on Facebook, uh, one of my friends maybe, bought the shoes. You know, so they would try to track that down and, and figure that out. Maybe they find that... Uh, they, we, uh, they, sometimes they find that there's these people that... Uh, a lot of people really trust them. And so if I posted, uh, maybe people are like, man, Matt has really good taste in shoes. <laughs> Doubtful. Uh, I'll go ahead and buy those. You know, so it can work like that. You have these sort of hub people, and sort of the, I forget what they call them, mavens, something like that, but really key influencers uh, that, you know, if you can get this person to retweet or share your stuff, it'll translate into sales. Um, let's see. Unlike outdoor and TV ads, the marketers can track the online behavior all the way through. So that's, again, a big advantage. You can get on Twitter and see who's retweeted it and so on. Uh, let's see. The next step is to associate influence to investment. This is where the dollars come in. Divide the total revenue generated via social efforts by the number of social media fans and followers, and you get a per fan follower value. Hmm. So that's sort of interesting. So I guess with my uh, Matt chat, uh, what I could do, I could look at all the people donating on PayPal and on Patreon, and then divide that by the number of them. And then I could probably figure out, like, was it a, are they worth like a dollar to me? <laughs> Five dollars to me? You know, figure out where that math is. Because, uh, again, a lot of the times, people think you need these huge numbers, but that's not always the case. You know, if you if you got to certain kind of clientele, uh, you could have a lot fewer 
people reading your blog or a lot fewer people coming. It's like a restaurant, right? If it's a very exclusive restaurant that charges high prices, you don't necessarily need, you know, to have a line going out the door. Uh, you just want to make sure that you have very loyal uh, customers who can afford or at least think your <laughs> food is worth it. Uh, let's see. Process of monetization. The value of each fan increases on the basis of a social media strategy. Remain engaged in ways your fans like and try to bump them up the loyalty ladder. Art of people interacting with people, not logos. You know, so again, you get some somebody comes on Matt Chat, they watch an episode, they leave a comment, ask me a question or something. Uh, or they get on my Twitter, they become a follower of mine on Twitter. They sign up for the Facebook thing on Matt Chat, whatever it is. Uh, if I reach, if I reply to them or answer their questions, start interacting with them, uh, then they might, uh, I guess the idea is here that they become more loyal, right? This is, you know, they maybe they think, I've got kind of a special relationship with Matt. You know, I, I can comment. I left a comment on his video. He commented back himself. You know, so I feel better about that than I do these other YouTubers who never respond or who don't even have comments turned on. Uh, you know, I, they, they feel like I can interact with Matt. I can I can tweet him on Twitter. He gets back to me. Uh, he, uh, you know, he's basically available for things. Uh, you would feel a little bit more loyal. You might think, well, okay, you know, I'll go ahead and buy his book. <laughs> or I'll go ahead and, you know, sign up for his Patreon. I'll become a patron uh, just because of that level of interaction. So it's, it's kind of a different way to think about building up an audience, I think. It, with, like with an author, imagine you're, you're writing novels or short stories. It's not so much about the quality of the story. And of course, that's part of it. But it's it's also about you know, sort of having these loyal followers who will you know buy your next book. <laughs> I guess in some sense you could have a you could be a great writer, but if you don't, if if you're not really trying to leverage that social media uh, base, uh, you're you're going to be missing out. All right, so uh, here's the first question for you. Uh, so 3M, that's a big Minnesota company. It's uh, been on the news recently. I don't know when you'll be watching this, but they're they're talking a lot about them now because they make these uh, face masks. And there's a, a viral outbreak. Uh, but anyway, I was pleased to see. I, I got a, I, I just did a Google search for like the top companies that are using social media, something like that. And 3M was actually near the top of the list. So apparently they are doing something right. They're getting a lot of recognition. A lot of people are looking to them. Uh, they're looking at the way 3M is using social media, basing their own strategies on them. So way to go. 3M. Uh, so anyway, look at this Twitter posting I've got here. I'll post a link to that in the question. And, you know, read the tweet, but what I really want you to look at, not so much what they tweeted, is look look down below it where people are asking them questions or replying, you know, and see if you can figure out, are people, do people seem happy with 3M? Do they seem loyal to 3M? Do you think 3M is building up loyalty somehow? Or, or, or are they doing the opposite? actually getting up, uh, leaving people disgruntled. Does it take a while? Let's see if you can write about uh, 50 to 100 words on that, and then we'll move on. Okay, let's see. Where are, oh, the, <laughs> yeah, uh, the insincerity factor. Uh, you know, this is where we really get into the ethics of all this stuff. So a lot of times it's not just about building up a big audience, making a lot of money. You want to think, am I going about this in an ethical way? Am I somehow cheating? Is it borderline fraud? Is it deceit? <laughs> you know, there's lots of ways you can go all awry uh, when you start dealing with money. You know, people are, when there's money involved, there is usually crime involved, or at least potentially involved somewhere. At the very least, some underhanded dealing. So Martin says you should just avoid the paper tweet programs. So they're out there. They're usually not from very scrupulous companies, but you will sometimes see things like, uh, oh, just retweet this thing and I'll give you, you know, a gift. You got a chance to get a gift card or something. You know, you used to see that all the time, sometimes even from these bigger companies. 
let's say retweet this for a chance to you know get a Starbucks gift card or whatever chance to win the product and then they might say but you also have to talk about how much you like it <laughs> uh, so she says that's usually not a good idea because again once people see that you're just doing it uh, you don't have their best best interest at heart right you're just doing it for a chance to win or chance to get paid uh, suddenly like everything else you've posted becomes suspect and you're like, I don't know if I can trust Matt anymore you know now that there's this big he's driving around in the Chevy Cruze and uh, you know I, I he never even talked about them he said he hated Chevy but then now he's got one <laughs> for tweeting about Chevy I don't I'm just making stuff up but uh, you get the idea right uh, she says you can do it and I don't know you know, I don't know what you think about this. I was a little bit, I wasn't quite convinced, <coughs> to be honest. Uh, but she says that, you know, as long as you're up front about, okay, Chevy Cruz is sponsoring this tweet or sponsoring this video, whatever. And there is some value there. It's not just her talking about how much she loves the car or truck or what. I don't even know what this is. <laughs> Cruiser. <laughs> uh, she's interviewing athletes. So you sort to get the celebrities in there. So you might be... I guess you could say there's some content there that's interesting, regardless of the Chevy Cruze. Uh, so she said, that's fine. You know, and I know a lot of, uh, most of the podcasts I listen to, YouTubers I watch, a lot of them will have a sponsorship. Uh, usually some kind of manufacturer of the products. Uh, who's the guy? There's a couple of survival shows I like to watch. I uh, can't believe I'm blinking on the guy's name. Yeah, it used to be part, part of that dual wild show. Uh, but anyway, he'll have like knives and belts and <clears throat> rations, you know, just sort of stuff that kind of makes sense uh, for his uh, his uh, theme of his show. Uh, but he always mentioned that you'll say, look, this, uh, you know, I, I am a sponsor. These This knife maker is sponsoring me. So, you know, take it with a grain of salt. But on the other hand, you know, even if they weren't, uh, this is the brand I would prefer. You know, so they'll say something like that. And. You know, as long as you have a heads up, I think, and you're like, okay, he just told me that that company is sponsoring his show or they're endorsing him in some fashion. So if I tend, if I choose to ignore that and just, you know, buy the knife anyway, you know, maybe some of that is on me. Maybe I should have been a little more skeptical. At least I think that's what Martin is saying. So at least you've given somebody a chance to be skeptical, not just passing it off as your uh, unadulterated opinion. Uh, Seinfeld, if you like him, I know to see, he's got a show, I've watched a few episodes of this, called Comedians in Cars Getting Coffee. And I was reading about how that works, and he's got some, uh, some endorsements, I guess, some sponsorships. I think there's Lovaza, it's a coffee company uh, that's supporting that, and then Acura. So I guess if you watch it, if you have this in mind, you might say, oh, wow, he really seems to like that Lavazza <laughs> coffee. <laughs> you know, they probably wouldn't be saying, oh, let's try Lavazza. I'm spitting it out. <laughs> yeah, let's see. Comedians in cars getting coffee. Seinfeld will put the spotlight on Acura's lineup, but include other brands as well. So this is a pretty good example so, you know, I always just think, like, how much money does Seinfeld freaking need? <laughs> he must be like a several times a millionaire. But anyway, all right, so I guess he needs more money. Uh, so he's doing this show. Uh, he's got Acura paying the bills, I suppose. And the the con, well, I guess what you tune in for, you don't tune in to watch the Acura stuff. You know, you tune in to watch him uh, interact with Chris Rock and Letterman and so on. So, you know, really, the more I think about it, this is like as old as TV or radio. One of my favorite comedians from when I was a kid was Jack Benny. And even back then, it was in, it was considered old, but uh, my family's kind of weird. We watched all these old black and white shows. Uh, but anyway, I remember at the start of those Jack Benny shows, he would they'd say something like, this episode's brought to you by, be like a cigarette company or something. And at some point of the show, they would come out and talk about the uh, the products uh, so really, this is kind of old stuff. I don't really know how new, just because it's in digital media, I don't know to what extent it's really new. 
Uh, anyway, the paper tweeting, I guess, is kind of kind of new. Uh, so read one of these articles about Bloomberg. So you probably have heard that name a few times at this point. <laughs> it seems to be everywhere. <laughs> these ads. So I don't care about you know. Don't even get into like Democrat, Republican, whatever. I don't. That's not the point of the question. What I want you to do is just look at the ethics of the behavior. So look at what these. Uh, look at the way that team is using social media. And I've got uh, three different sources here. You don't have to look at all of them, but just find. Uh, just click on one. Uh, I think we got New York Times, LA Times, and then Fox Business. So three different perspectives on this, if you will. But they're basically alleging that he is paying people. He's doing that paper tweeting thing uh, that we that Martin says you shouldn't do. Uh, so here it is. This is kind of recent context. So look at that. And then uh, write a little bit about what you think about this. Do you think this is ethical? Do you think it's okay? Do you think that, I don't even know if, to what extent this is Bloomberg. Let's just assume it's his team uh, advocating this. But what do you think about the situation? Again, just the use of the social media. Uh, you know, I don't I don't need you to get into the uh, the politics. All right, then moving on, we've got journalism. Uh, let's see. <clears throat> it's not a very helpful title slide, Matt. <laughs> uh, professional versus amateur journalist. So this is a question. We, he's talked about this before. How I guess basically he used to be kind of this card-carrying journalist. You watch these old movies, again with the old black and white movies, but you'd see the reporters with the, those hats and they have like a press <laughs> like a label <laughs> on their hat. So, you know, we're the press, you know, so you have to let us in. And it's almost like uh, uh, superheroes or something. And of course, nowadays, it seems like just any old person can call themselves a journalist. You know, there's, I remember, it seemed like a decade ago, but there was just all this controversy about, should we just let these so-called bloggers into our press conference? You know, they're not real reporters. They're not journalists. And of course, they would say, "Yes, we are. You know, we more people read our blog than read the New York Times." Okay, we'll let you in. <laughs> uh, so he says, uh, "Carol says it's not so much about what uh, what you're doing is how and why you're doing it. That's what really is the difference." Uh, so he says, "Professional journalists are quote called upon to act independently and to be accountable for what they write and publish." They are supposed to provide readers with information needed to be free and self-governing. And so I think you can see the ethical component there. But I think the real, uh, the main part of this for me is this idea about being accountable for what they write and publish. So if you're just an amateur, you can say, look, it's just a blog. You know, I don't, I just post whatever. Uh, you can't sue me. <laughs> don't sue me. I'm just a, you know, private citizen posting an opinion. Uh, that's sort of protected speech. But that's a different, it'd be different if you're saying, I'm a journalist, and this is the news, and then you're posting uh, false information about somebody. And, you know, especially if it's something damaging. You know, they can get you for a libel uh, or slander, uh, for things of that sort. So there is, you know, there's legal implications here beyond just being ethical. You actually get sued and even thrown in jail, uh, you know, if you're not careful with this stuff. And here's some more. Um, Carol doesn't talk about this, but this is something I've written a lot about. Uh, there's a book called uh, The Power Elite by this uh, sociologist, C. Wright Mills. It's a classic book of sociology. I think it's great. I think everybody should read it. It's a really good book. It's not too long. It's actually readable. <laughs> but you can get, uh, if, you're, you know, if you're interested in this topic, it's a great source because you could, you could cite this and work with it uh, and write about it. But anyway, uh, Mills talks about two things, the public on the one hand versus the mass. So you could have a public or a mass. And if it's, I guess you could say, if it's sort of a repressive society, a lot of propaganda, that's the mass. Uh, if it's a true democracy, functioning democracy, then it would be the uh, a public. And so that's the idea. And then he breaks it down into these categories. So if it's a public, <clears throat> which is what you want, uh, virtually as many people express an opinion as receive them. Uh, the public communications are organized that there's a chance immediately and effectively to answer back any opinion expressed in public. 
Uh, the opinion formed by such discussion readily finds an outlet in effective action, even if, against, if necessary, the prevailing system of authority and the authoritative institutions do not penetrate the public, which is thus more or less autonomous in its operations. So he is writing this, I believe, back in the 50s. And so well before the internet. And what people were using him for, uh, well, hang on, let me show you the mass, is, uh, mass slide first. So this is the public. Move forward, there we go. So if it's the opposite of that is the mass, masses. So if, you're, if it's a mass, then far fewer people express opinions than receive them. Uh, the community or of public becomes an abstract collection of individuals who receive impressions from the mass media. Uh, the communications are so organized it's difficult or impossible to answer back or with any effect. Uh, the realization of opinion and action is controlled by authorities who organize and control the channels. And the mass has no autonomy from institutions. On the contrary, agents of authorized institutions penetrate the mass, reducing any autonomy it might have in the formation of opinion. Uh, so you could see, like one of these, the masses to me is sort of like this totalitarian, propagandistic sort of place, uh, whereas the public would be more democratic. You know, you can sort of speak truth to power without being afraid, <laughs> that sort of thing. Uh, anyway, the, a lot of people were using Mills to talk about this uh, phenomenon before social media where all the news, basically all television, and you could say the same thing about radio or uh, book publishers, but whereas there used to be this a large number of publishers, a large number of studios, a lot of newspapers that were independent, uh, there was just a few big corporations that were sort of gobbling up all of these uh, formerly uh, independent newspapers or TV channels or whatever. So it basically boiled down to, I think, there was something like three or four giant global corporations that were controlling everything. You know, and of course, back in the 50s and 60s, uh, you couldn't, there was no way to really reply back. You know, you couldn't get a spot on uh, a news program just because you wanted one. Uh, so that, that we were really more like this uh, mass than the public. Uh, and then, so what a lot of people like me were saying back in the 2000s was, well, look at Twitter. Well, I don't know if Twitter was even around back then, but, you know, look at uh, these discussion boards. A lot of the, when the newspapers were moving online, they would have a comment section. And that comment section was kind of the early version of a Twitter-like thing, right? You could reply to the author and receive some uh, feedback. So we said, it's really making things more like a public. Uh, of course, what we have found is that's not always a good thing. You know, just making, just because, you know, let's look at this first one. As many people express opinions as receive them. That would be great, but, you know, what if a lot of the people are wrong? Or what if a lot of these, most, most people haven't really looked at the issue, don't know what the heck they're talking about, yet they're still out there you know, giving their opinion and is having equal weight, or if not more weight, uh, than somebody with a little bit more knowledge. So it's it's kind of challenging that view. Maybe the public's, you know, maybe this isn't the holy grail after all. You know, maybe there's some <laughs> somewhere in between is actually the sweet spot. <laughs> uh, but anyway, what digital journalists need to know. So you need to know how to research, organize your information. And we'll talk a little bit about this feed reader business, uh, how to stay on top of specific trends via email alerts, Twitter, and search feeds, and then uh, know how to develop source relationships uh, via the social media. Now, so let's just take a look here. Let's see how quickly I can do this. All right, so if I just go to Google, yeah, Google email alerts, uh, you can monitor the web for interesting new content. So again, google.com slash alerts, and we could type in whatever we wanted here. Why don't I type in computer role-playing games? And then what I can, it's going to go uh, Google everything every day, basically. And then I could say, I want you to email this at most once a day, or I could say, as it happens, that would probably be a nightmare. <laughs> once a week, sources, and you know, I could specify what I want, uh, any region, so you could say just U.S. stuff, how many, only the best, deliver it, 
can see one of the options here is an RSS feed. Now that's not such a big deal anymore. Uh, there, it used to be a thing probably around the time Carol was writing this, everybody had their RSS feed reader. Now I don't really hear too much about that anymore. Uh, but basically there's there's programs you could set up to where this it basically makes everything formatted something like a blog so you can think about it like a your own custom blog where it's pulling in all these uh, articles from everywhere you know then i can create the alert and this is just emailing now another option is uh google news all right so you can get on there and do the same thing i just showed you you just say search for a topic and then you could say add that to my list so when you get your google news you could have this little section that where it's going to be combing through just like the, it's basically the same as this really that google news is kind of like the rss feeds used to be and so you could just have a little you know whatever think of some topics you're interested in set up those sections and then uh, add that to your google news page uh, so that's what he's talking about there and let me just show you Twitter real quick. You can do the same sort of thing with Twitter. You notice up here it says uh, politics trending. So the, this is a hashtag here, that pound sign, number sign, whatever you want to call it, coronavirus update. So if that was something you wanted to follow, you could just click on that. And then let's see, search setting. Yeah, save the search. So you could save this. And then you would be able to monitor that. Monitor that so whenever anything new showed up in that hat with that hashtag, you know, it would pop up there for you. I think you could even. Uh, I'm sure you could find an app for your phone, uh, where it would actually, you know, beep you <laughs> uh, with that. So there's lot, basically, there's lots of different ways to stay on top of things like that, and instead of just manually googling it every time. All right, some other things digital journalists need to know. Revenue streams, right? Because you might be independent now. You know, how are you going to make money? How are you going to keep yourself afloat financially? Are you going to have ads? Are you going to have uh, a patron Patreon system? Uh, are you going to be selling uh, related merchandise, taking donations? You know, how are you going to handle that? Uh, this used to be somebody else's job. You're just a reporter. You don't have anything to do with that. But now you might that might be the <laughs> very important uh, how to build a team, work with a project management, and it's, you know how do you have work with multiple authors, multiple editors, uh, knowing a little bit about how to analyze an audience, look at those demographics, uh, marketing on social media. So do you want to use AdWords? Do you want YouTube ads? You know how are you going to do that? Uh, mobile strategies. That's a whole other can of worms, business plans, competitive analysis, public speaking. So you might think, I don't want to do any public speaking. I'm just a writer. Uh, yet, you might find yourself in need of some public speaking skills, especially if you're trying to convince somebody uh, to support you. And then even legal and regulatory frameworks. So that's stuff we were just talking about. You know, if you don't know what libel means, if you don't know what slander means, if you don't know much about copyright infringement, uh, you know, you might get sued and even go to jail, you know, if you're just posting stuff. So you really would behoove you uh, to uh, at least know the basics of that stuff so that you can stay out of trouble. So this is over on page 271. And he's talking here about something uh, that's near and dear. I don't know about dear, but <laughs> I think most of us are familiar with, and that is... You know, dealing with an online community. So you got a discussion board. You know, is that always just because you set up that discussion discussion board? Does that mean you're going to have this, these productive and uh, enriching conversations with people, uh, or is it just going to become a time time uh, sink, uh, or is it going to get you upset? Uh, so he says here, I think it's a pretty good quote: "Audience interaction can yield better stories and more interesting content." But it also opens the door to arguments, mindless debates, and comments so inane, so egregious, <laughs> that you might want to pull the plug on the whole enterprise, as many have done. And then uh, he cites popular science of all places. Comments can be bad for science. Yeah, so I know people, 
There's a message board, a lot of uh, compositionists get on, grad students seem to love it, called the WPAL, Writing Program Administrator List. So it's one of those things where it's, it's done over email. And I have colleagues, and they will just, they will spend all day long on that thing, you know, writing these basically five paragraph essays every day, you know, dealing with the topic, whatever it is, and they just really sink a lot of time into like arguing with people. Never really seems to get anywhere, in my opinion, you know, but you probably know somebody, maybe you're like this yourself, right? You, you see that comment on your Facebook wall, somebody has tweeted you or said something on a forum. Next thing you know, you spent like four hours responding <laughs> to something that really didn't deserve two minutes of your time. I mean, you didn't even deserve the time it took to read it, uh, much less to be responding to it. Uh, you know, this is, so I see what he's saying there. You probably would agree that, yeah, you know, on the one hand, you know, I see this on Matt Chat all the time. You know, I'll post a video and then I'll say something like, you know, let me know what you think about this. And uh, a lot of times it's not so bad for Matt Chet. I think that the clientele, the, the, the audience is kind of a niche anyway. Uh, but I've seen other people's, uh, you know, comments feeds and it's just a lot of just, I don't know, just crazy crap. <laughs> only thing I can come up with, just, you're just like, what? Yeah. And, you know, and I would always just say, just ignore that. You know, don't even, it's not even worth the time to uh, to engage with it. Uh, but yet, you know, it's so easy to get off. And, you know, just, just lose, you know, give stuff like that way more credit than, it, than it's worth. So I guess then the short of it is you might get good information. You know, if I say, sometimes I'll say, uh, you know, tell me about this. You know, if you were around, if you went to this event, you know, let me know what, what it was like. So you might get some good stories, some insights. Uh, on the other hand, you might get people there that are just making stuff up, have no idea what they're talking about, and they're, I think a lot of times could just be kids, <laughs> you know, having some fun, <laughs> uh, pretending to be somebody that was there. Uh, so, you know, it is what it is. Let's see, relationships. So just like Martin, uh, Carol's saying the same thing about how you need to spend the time to build these relationships. Now learn the names of the sources children that sounds a little creepy doesn't it <laughs> I don't think he means it quite like uh, in a mafia style situation but uh, just getting to know people as human beings I think is really the key so it's not a source you know they talk about the source you know it almost sounds like an inanimate object right or a, a drawer cabinet floppy disk whatever uh, whereas really these are people you know they have lives they have families they have values so if you can just get to know them as people, uh, that will make your job easier. You know, so when there is uh, some news happening, you have this relationship, so they know who you are. You know, you show up. And I notice if you watch carefully during one of these big press, uh, what do you call them, the press meetings, meetings with the press, these big shot politicians. You know, a lot of the times the journalist uh, will ask a question, and the uh, the speaker will say, we'll know that person's name. Oh, hi, Joe. Uh, and you could tell that they've talked a little bit off the record or they have some kind of friendship, maybe. Might not be too big of a stretch, but you could tell that they, that reporter has definitely invested some time in trying to get to know this person beyond just, uh, you know, at these press briefings, uh, just for this purpose, right? So they will be more comfortable, have more trust. And so they talked about a guy, or Carol talks about a guy that would show up to the county courthouse with some coffee and donuts. <laughs> uh, just say, I guess, uh, hey, here's some coffee and donuts. So uh, why don't you, I'm kind of lonely. Why don't you come chat with me, judge? <laughs> or whatever. I don't know, but just trying to get to know somebody. You know, I noticed this with the, uh, the textbook publishers. They will do this. You know, they'll just sometimes just show up with some coffee and sandwiches. And, you know, you might want to, look at their books but sometimes you just chat you know they're just kind of it's almost like they're there just to kind of meet you and socialize get to know you a little bit so that when they do come around with a new book you know they know who you are you have some kind of basis it's not just random sales bot 2017 coming uh you know who oh okay yeah, it's mike hey mike you know let's see two best questions uh so if you do have this inter if you're interviewing somebody trying to get information or I would say if you're a student doing research 
uh, maybe you're doing a thesis or whatever, and you find some useful information or some facts that look like you might want to use, you should ask these questions. So first, how do you know that? Show me some evidence. So somebody is kind of coming back to Martin, right? Uh, so she's saying that her social media, digital, digital royalty or whatever, that's effective. She says that. So you'd want to ask her, well, what kind of demonstrable proof can you offer? So she's got that. that's a whole chapter that we just read, which is trying to do that, right? trying to show you some proof that it works. You know, same thing with uh, teaching, right? You say, I've created this lesson plan. It's a great lesson plan, but how do you prove it? Uh, what, what is your evidence for that? And then the second question, what do you mean? So if there's something that you don't quite understand, asking for clarification, trying to get at it two or three different ways could be very helpful. And this is certainly true. If you don't understand it, your readers certainly won't get it either. So I notice this a lot, and especially in 191 classes. If a student is writing about something technical or some kind of science-based stuff, you know, they'll, they'll find some material. They, you could tell they really don't get it. So what they do, they just copy it verbatim, big, massive block quote, like right in the middle of their paper somewhere. There's no, they don't say anything about it or try to explain it. They just kind of dump it in. And I can see that the reason they did that is they couldn't, they didn't understand it well enough to like paraphrase it, summarize it. Now, of course, they probably weren't in a position to notify that author and say, hey, could you explain this? <laughs> uh, what they should have done, though, is, you know, looked around, looked up some of those terms. Sometimes Wikipedia can help with this, too. You know, just try to get familiar enough with it to uh, be able to explain it. And then if you just if you just absolutely can't understand it, you're better off not including it because uh, it will just kind of just, again, why are you doing that? It kind of diminishes your credibility. <clears throat> yeah, this is just something I liked, reporters and editors. Uh, I think this is so true for professors and teachers as well. You know, you make the familiar unfamiliar, right? So you, your students think they know something, but sometimes you can show them a new, uh, a new way to look at it, or the opposite, the unfamiliar familiar. The complex, somehow understandable, <laughs> probably more likely the mundane, somehow interesting and worthwhile. You know, I always think it's, you can tell you're reading a really great reporter, a really great, great journalist or great writer, when they can take something that at first seems really boring, but they make it so much fun. You know, thinking about the city budgets, uh, one of my favorite examples is a game called Sim City, where you're just planning a city and putting up like power power stations and putting uh, figuring out where to put roads and where to build neighborhoods. <laughs> it, sounds, it just sounds so terrible, uh, but yet it's like one of the most fun games you'll ever play. It's very addictive. So I think that's really the difference there. You know, if you can make something really boring a lot of fun, uh, that's how you know you've got some real skill. You know, anybody could take something exciting and make it you know, exciting, but doing a, going from boring to exciting takes talent. Uh, let's see, interviewing questions. You know, I'm not going to go through all these. I just have the, the list here from the book. So the, these are pretty, what did it smell like? <laughs> yeah, that could certainly be a question that probably doesn't get asked very much. I think, they, didn't he give an example in the book about this? Somebody asked him what it smelled like, and they hadn't thought about that, and it turned out to be crucial. You know, I could be making that up, but uh, you know, what do you fear? What are what were your other options? Why do you care about that? You know, these are the kind of questions I'd want to have handy. Usually, when I do an interview, I have at least sometimes as many as twenty questions or topics there ready to go. Uh, but a lot of times you don't really get the full answer that you were looking for. You know, so you ask a big question, you get, you know, a sentence. So this would be a handy list to have sitting by so you could say, well, okay, uh, tell me a little bit more. What did it smell like? <laughs> you know, and get them to kind of go back and think about it some more and uh, flesh out that answer. So, all right, as far as verifying uh, things, you know, what do we know uh, or if you're dealing with students, you know, how do you build up that bibliography? Uh, how do you uh, make sure your information is accurate? How do you know these sources are accurate, not just fake, and not just a 
uh, somebody's opinion, but based on some kind of fact, uh, it's verification. Uh, so the step one is to realize we don't yet know what we don't know. So that took me a couple tries to figure out what that means. So realize we don't yet know what we don't know. So you might think you know a lot of stuff, uh, but you don't actually know it. And there might be a lot of unknowns out there. And so I think that's sort of the, it's, it's not so much, I guess the idea is you can never, you're always going to be in this situation, right? But the important thing is to realize it, not be overconfident. Uh, step two, triangulate and corroborate. <laughs> if your mother tells you she loves you, <laughs> that's great, but check it out. Get another source. Maybe go ask a, uh, ask a dad, maybe. But anyway, these are two big steps. Uh, a lot of times, you know, especially when you're dealing with something uh, controversial or somebody has a strong opinion about something, uh, they will almost be oblivious to the other side. They think, there is no other side or, you know, the, the case has been settled. Uh, this is how it is. They're not even willing to. But even if they are, they're trying to keep an open mind. Uh, a lot of times you, uh, you know, what seems to be true, what seems to be accurate turns out not to be. You know, just think about all the times uh, you have seen something on Facebook, you know, and shared it or liked it or looked legit. You know, and then only later you found out this was total bogus. You know, it's happened to me before, uh, for sure. So it's, you can't always tell just by the way that it, you know, might look just so convincing. You know, it's got sources and all this stuff, uh, but you still need to triangulate. So try to find two or three other sources, hopefully from different newspapers or different magazines or different uh, journals or websites, you know, whatever. Uh, but you, you really want to get very different sources that are all saying the same thing. You know, like with this, some of the stuff I've been pointing out. Well, Martin says this, but also Carol says it. So that, you'd, I, I feel better about those because you feel like you've kind of corroborated it. It's been, you know, if we had a third, yet a third source that said the same thing, then we could feel pretty good about it. And it's the same thing with all these uh, stories that come out. You know, I always try to check at least, I'm trying to get into the habit now. If I see something that looks questionable, you know, I'll go to Google, type it into the Google News, you know, and type it out and see. Uh, can I get it from just a, you know, a couple other major news sources? You know, then you might feel pretty good about it. But, you know, as Carol says, sometimes they're just uh, posting the same sources that were just made up to begin with. And so it's a big issue. You know, it's one of the issues we talked about in the article I was telling you about that I uh, co-wrote was... Uh, you know, even professional journalists that have been in the business for 20, 30 years can get a lot of this stuff wrong. They can be fooled, uh, I won't say just as easily, but they can be fooled. You can't just totally trust them either. Uh, so what chance does, you know, the poor first-year student have, you know, that doesn't have nearly the, uh, the training or the experience? So, you know, it is a big problem. It might be the defining problem of our times, really. Uh, Kovic... And Rosenstein recommended an accuracy checklist. So this would be something you could share with us students or use yourself. So looking at the lead of the story, does it have proper support? Uh, do you understand the background of what's going on? Uh, who are the stakeholders? Does the story pick sides or make subtle value judgments? You know, that could be a, a clue that it could be biased, right? And it, there's a question of could it ever not be biased, but... Uh, at least uh, knowing the bias might help you. Uh, well, some people like this story more than they should. You know, that's an interesting one. And then if you go on down here, it just gets into some really uh, brass tack stuff. Like, have you checked the phone numbers? Have you tried out those URLs? You know, the story might be citing links for sources, but you don't bother to click the links. I mean, for all you know, those might be dead links or be the old... Uh, uh, the Rick Rolling, <laughs> uh, email addresses, etc. Do the numbers add up or check out? Do you have multiple sources for controversial or counterintuitive facts? So I don't know what your experience has been like, but a lot of times I'll have students come in and they'll, especially if it's some kind of wacky thing they're writing about, you're looking at the sources and it's just all like uh, Infowars. 
<laughs> you know, maybe you want to find a couple more sources. You know, I don't know. Uh, just kind of a guess. Uh, let's see. For its part, uh, BBC News created what it called the UGC, User Generated Content Hub, in order to curate and verify social media content. Uh, so look at the stuff they do. This is a this is a pretty helpful, I think. I wouldn't have thought of some of this stuff. Like referencing locations against maps and existing images, in particular geolocated ones. So they, I seem like I've read about this a couple of times where they, there'll be some incident and you'll be looking at these photos. I think there's one like a gas attack or something. And so people were starting to look at those images and find out and found out they weren't actually where they said they were. Or that these photos were from some, somewhere else or they were just old photos that had, had been, uh, somebody found them and was trying to make out like those were brand new. Uh, so stuff like that happened. So you could, you know, just look and like what's in the background of the picture maybe. See if you could find some some clues. They talked about like license plate, yeah, license plates, type of vehicles. Um, this was a good one too, like the weather reports. And this is, I never would have thought of this. But yeah, you know, if they're saying this was, this happened yesterday at St. Cloud, well, you would know that because you know you were here, you know what the weather was like. But if you weren't, you know, you can get on one of these sites and see what was the weather that day. Oh, it says here that it was, you know, really cloudy and raining or snowing heavily all day. Yet in this photo, it looks like a bright sunny day. Hmm. Uh, searching the original source of the upload sequences is an indicator. So some of this is pretty advanced and some of it is just common sense. You might, you might not think to do it, but let's see, what is this one? Working with colleagues to ascertain that accents and language are correct for the location. All right, so you might not know the language and think, well, that's Russian or that's uh, that's our, you know, that's uh, Arabic or something. Uh, if you know somebody who knows those languages, you could ask them, could you listen to this and tell me if that's if I'm right, I said, no, that's, <laughs> you know, you're wrong. That's Spanish or something. And then, you know, it was bogus. Uh, they give a few other tools here. I thought I would show you these quickly. This first one is to look up a domain. So this, sometimes you see something on Facebook and it'll have a link to it, but you're not like sure. Uh, you never seen that URL before. Uh, so this would be a way you could uh, find out. Let's see if we can do one real quick. Let's just do St. Cloud State .edu. <clears throat> okay, and then it brings us here. And we can see that it's registered to St. Cloud State University. So that's a big that's a big uh, plus. If that said uh, some other university or just somebody's name there or some company we'd never heard of, that would be kind of a clue that this might not be legit, not actually St. Cloud State. And you can scroll down there and you can see who the, there's some way we could contact this person. I'm not sure what all this other information is here, but you know, it gives you some sense that that's legit. Uh, then they talked about this one called 10i. Uh, so this would be useful, again, if you see that photo, you're not sure if that photo actually corroborates the story or if it's just some old stock footage. Sorry, excuse me, some, some stock photo. I think we have to actually paste a photo into that. So <laughs> uh, I don't think I have anything handy. Let's just scroll down and see how it, we can get an example of how this works. Yeah, so they it just I guess scans the its database to see where that photo has showed up before. You know, so this could certainly be handy. They have a, the ability with Photoshop and other programs like that to um, basically make something look realistic. You know, it looks like an actual photo. Sometimes they'll put in people that weren't there or cut out people. Uh, or who knows what. So you could use that 10i program to see. Maybe this showed up first at like a meme site. <laughs> or maybe this is a, from an old article. You know, maybe a decade ago. Who knows? 
And this was the one that he said was good for the, you could find out like what the weather was like. Why don't we try that? Let's see, weather in St. Cloud, Minnesota on January 1st, 20, let's do 20, let's see about this year. I haven't really used this, so we'll see. Well, that was easy enough. Weather on January 1st, it says temperature 7 to 30, partly cloudy and clear. Then we get cloud cover, a lot of, wow, look at that. You know, like wind speed. <laughs> so quite a bit of uh, info there. So again, if you're trying to figure out is that legit or not, you know, maybe go in there and see what, what was the weather like that day that would be revealing. All right, some of this other stuff I'm not going to spend a lot of time on. I mean, it's, again, pretty basic stuff. I'm sure you know about the inverted pyramid uh, of a newspaper article. You know, you start with the important information, work your way down into the details. Uh, the chrono chronological stories, just, you know, as things happen. Uh, first, this happened. Second, this happened. Third, this happened. Uh, the narrative is your classic story format you know, with a beginning, middle, and an end. Uh, the hourglass is kind of interesting. So that kind of starts with the inverted pyramid, but then shifts into that chronological. And he used the example there of a, a report about a, a game, like some sports. So you'd probably start off just giving the basic facts of the game, uh, but then you might want to shift into like the first inning, second inning, whatever, uh, to give some sense. A little more fun to read it like that. Uh, thematic, so just organized by themes. Focus styles, another one I wasn't familiar with. It's kind of fun to read about that. Uh, so that starts with the lead. Uh, so I guess kind of a, the gist of it. Then they got, or the I guess the hook. And then you have the nutshell, so sort of story, quick summary, followed by a main body and then a kicker. <laughs> uh, and then the sidebar, which that's kind of self-explanatory, right? A little something on the side to give you more info. Uh, then he talks about multimedia possibilities so since this will be online it's digital you could do more than just write so you get some examples there you can have a video or an audio interview with just somebody there at the scene somebody at the heart of the story reactions from the people responsible uh, then all these graphics interviews with experts anything that could help you clarify the issue uh, visual help could be graph could be a graph could be a chart Reenactments. Uh, this is kind of ambitious here, but you know, I suppose you could get some uh, actors together and you know, play out a scene. Or maybe use some uh, 3D animation. Uh, and then he talked about the curation, and he he's got a link to one called Storify, but it doesn't exist anymore. Uh, there's a couple other ones you can try. So really, what these are, it's kind of ways just to collect a bunch of different websites. PDFs, videos, whatever. Everything in one place. Let me zoom over so you can actually see it. So there's a, it seems like there's about a hundred of these kind of services. It'll put a little thing on your search bar where you can bookmark something. I guess the difference between this and something like Evernote is with this, you, you can invite people to, to look at it and you can build kind of a blog looking thing you know, collaborate and share. This one's called Wakelet. Seems to be the most popular one. <laughs> Wakelet. <laughs> Let's try out the other one there. Paper. Dot L I. Paperly. Easiest way to collect, publish, and share content on the web. So it looks like the same sort of thing. Yeah, so there's a, it's kind of small, but you can sort of see the picture of it there. It looks sort of like a newspaper site. But I guess what this lets you do is, is tell it what kind of content you want to bring in and where to position it on the page. The Water Aid Weekly. Yeah, so this would definitely be an alternative if you didn't, if you wanted something beyond uh, WordPress, you know, something like that. Uh, you could certainly look into these... Uh, <clears throat> Uh, curation software. All right, so here's a question for you on uh, ethics of social media. So he mentions NPR 
and they're uh, they've written a lot about this with their reporters. They've had some trouble in the past with their uh, various personalities or whatever you want to call them, reporters, I guess, journalists, commentators, who uh, are posting things on their personal Twitter page, personal Facebook page, whatever, and then uh, they feel like it reflects negatively on NPR. So they have developed some policies around that. So they say, while NPR journalists generally enjoy their interactions with the public on social media, they have also been the targets of abuse on Twitter and other platforms. So they've come up with a set of guidelines here that I guess they think are appropriate. Uh, so I want you to, to look that over, see what you think about it. Do you like these? Do you not like them? Why or why not? Let's see if you give it, give me about 100 words on it, and then I'll come, come back and we'll finish up. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, so thank you for watching this. Hope you enjoyed that. Uh, please do ask me a question, uh, make a comment, and I'll see you next time.